before I get started and tell you what I do and, and hopefully help you today, I just, did you love Patty? I felt prompted to do something. She is really, uh, one of the things I relate to her, I can't really relate to her story, but the magnitude of what she is doing, I relate to. And the danger spiritually of what she's doing. If you understand what I'm saying, the, the enemy of our souls is uh, every country. I go into a lot of countries around the world. The LGBTQ is not just an American thing. It's a global thing. Even in the most remote regions of Africa. And even in the aboriginal communities of Australia, you'll see this, this struggle going on. And it's been taught. So what I'd like to do is I'd like for us to pray for Patty. Can we do that? And just bow your heads and let me lead you in, in a prayer. And what I want to ask God to do is to burden all of us that at some point, at any time the Holy Spirit wants to bring her to our minds throughout the day in and day out uh, journeys that we all have, that we would just pray for her as the Lord would prompt us. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for Patty. And Lord, the, the spiritual warfare that she no doubt encounters is massive. And God, I just pray that you will put inside of us right now a, a deposit by the Holy Spirit whereby we will yield to you to pray one for another. And that would include Patty. Lord, she, this ministry of hers out of Egypt is so needed right now. Protect her. Open doors for her. Keep her in perfect peace. But burden us to pray for her. And prompt us to do that from time to time. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. And God's people said, love you, Patty, and appreciate you. Well, um... Just a little bit about me. I'm married. That is my wife, uh, Beth. We were accidentally introduced one time as bad in breath. <laughs> they got tongue tied. So you know which one's bad. <laughs> um, but those are the mountains that we live in. That's not far from our house, I think. It's probably the National, Central National Park. I can't remember, but that's what it looks like where we live. Um, as you can tell from my accent, uh, we are, are hillbillies, which... Because I climbed off my mountain and got me some edumacation, I'm a high-class hillbilly, which is a hill William. I'm the hill William. And what I want to do is test the audio here. This is a, a 911 call that came in in hillbilly country. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, um, my wife got attacked by a warthog real bad, and I need someone to come up with an ambulance and pick her up. Okay, sir, uh, can you give me your address? Uh, yeah, we're at 1825 Eucalyptus Drive. Okay, could you spell that for me, sir? Uh, I, I'm going to drag her on over to Oak Street, and you can pick her up there. What? <laughs> it's real entertaining where I'm from. Y'all should come visit. <laughs> well, uh, I'm an author. And a researcher, and by ministry, I'm, uh, my story is simply this. The whole technology thing is I have a four-year degree in computer science. I used to teach at a college. I used to teach IT. I was an adjunct uh, at a college. And um, so I have the technical background. I graduated from Bible college as well, so I'm ordained as an evangelist. So I'm in full-time ministry. And the technology part really morphed um, into what you are going to hear today. One of my stops of research around the world, I have, have a number of them, but one is at the University of South Africa. It's a long story, but I'm part of the Bureau of Market Research and its neuroscience division. And what I've been tasked to do is identify trends with young people um, around the world and, and their parents and pr make proposals uh, to my colleagues, the guy on the right to the department head, and try to get research projects funded. So that's a whole different topic, but that's what I'm interested in. If you've seen the a documentary, The Social Dilemma. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that. You should watch it. Um, that's the sort of work that I've been doing for 16 years. But the ministry side of me is I preach on Sundays in any given part of the world. And I'm heavily involved in education systems, including i um, very honored to be one of the speakers at CCEA and the, the curriculum with Calvary Chapel. Uh, the Assemblies of God as well has a group. Uh, also ACE and Accelerated Education Enterprises on the continent of Africa. And 
So very much involved with kids on a ground level. So uh, this is in Manila. The first global homeschool conference was held there. I keynoted. And the other, one of the other key stops that I have is in Australia. I work with law enforcement, and we do lots of research. Uh, they open doors. We have access to kids to do research, which is very hard to get. And so we do lots of research, and I do speaking engagements. And then I go to other countries where it can be a little bit dangerous. But this topic that I have is open doors. These kids that you see, these Muslim kids, um, they are losing their kids to the, to the Quran and to mosque because they're all addicted to pornography and social media and video games, just like our kids. And they don't have, in this particular case, uh, in this country, they didn't have anybody speaking to it, so they asked me to come. Now, you know what I do. I'm not Muslim. I'm, I believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And there's no other name under heaven by which a man is saved except through the name of Jesus. So that's what God has done in this area of research. So the other thing, too, I spend quite a bit of time in the media. This is the ABC. It's the, the Australian version of ABC uh, in this particular case. And in the media talking about these things. So that's what I do. Lots of research and writing. So out, out at my table, we have... Uh, the book, Digital Cocaine, I'm working on a third one. It's all about digital detox. You'll get a little bit about that today, but the Spanish version is there as well. And then there's a DVD out there. It's subtitled in Spanish and English. And the audio book is all six and a half hours it took the voiceover guy who has a much manlier voice than me <laughs> uh, did the voiceover. So it's all, every chapter in the book, all 11 or 12 chapters, six and a half hours, if you're interested in the audio version of that. And probably the most important work I've ever done this is about five and a half hours on the subject of its videos of pornography. Pornea is where we get our modern English word. It's 25 times in the New Testament the word pornea appears. We transliterate that into the English as pornographic and pornography. The scripture speaks about it that many times. We don't like to talk about it in the American church, but it's in there. Always in a bad context as well. My opening text uh, I'm not anti-technology. I didn't renounce my computer science degree when I started studying neuroscience. I'm not a neuroscientist, by the way. Uh, I've written a book about the neuroscience of digital addiction and, and have been asked to join uh, in collaboration. But my expertise is in digital addiction, uh, addiction. But I prefer the scripture over everything else in my life. How about you? Before science, before psychology, neuropsychology, neurobiology, all that sort of stuff. The scripture is the anchor because that's God's word. And this is what God says about the issues of life, including our technology use. Everything is permissible. I'm using a tablet. I brought my own, some of my own gear so that I could control everything up here. Uh, love it. It's permissible. But not all things are beneficial. And then God shows us where the line is. And I'll show you where the line is with brain scans in a few minutes. But he says this. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be enslaved will not be controlled by or brought under its power or addicted. And the problem that we have with the technology is that it's very addictive neurobiologically and then it's brought sweeping cultural changes. Let me give you an example. This is recent research from the Barna Group and the 360 Institute. This is what, uh, this is, these are American stats, but it's generally true around the world. Generation Z, those born from 97 to 2012, in this country, across the board, only 4% now have a biblical worldview. Their parents, the millennials, or some of these millennials would be their parents. It's not much better. Only 6% of them have a biblical worldview now. And that's in our Christian schools, Christian universities, and in our Christian youth groups. That's why when Pastor Craig, which by the way, thank you for taking such good care of me. Pastor Craig, when he talked about the kid trying to show the pastor pornography, that's what he's talking about. It's very common. The Gen Xers, only 7%, 10% of the baby boomers. And when you look at this research, it all comes down to the culture coming through the devices that are influencing them more than we are now. Technology is what has caused these stats to become so alarming. Before COVID, the state of the American church was already dismal. Since COVID, the Barner Group has revealed to us that it's likely now that one in five churches are going to close, never to reopen. So Christianity is more than on the decline in America. These are some of the things that Patty deals with. 
This research from Gallup is only about two and a half, three weeks old now. One in six of our American Gen Zers are identifying in some form as LGBTQ. They're either sympathetic, they're struggling with the dysphoria, and all these sorts of things. And when you track it all back, where are they learning it from predominantly? It's their phones. This is extremely disturbing. Hardly a week goes by. I do lots of school tours around the world. The kids will come up and they'll pull up their pants legs. They'll pull up their sleeves. They'll show me these horrible cuts. The, uh, this, this comes from uh, out of every 100,000 uh, girls in this country, the rate that it has gone up, that it went up between 2011 and 2012 of self-harm, non-fatal self-harm, cutting and in other methods. I've seen kids who will pick at wounds and not allow them to heal. And I'll explain to you in a few minutes why they do it. But it went up 62% between 2011 and 2015 in the older group. And in that group, which includes preteens, the self-harm went up 189%. And even more horrifying, the same pattern held with suicide. The older teen girls, 15 to 19, that's up 70% compared to the first decade of this century. The preteen girls who traditionally had very low rates to begin with, up 151%. And all the research points back to one thing, social media. And the thing that is so horrifying to people like me who are on the ground dealing with this, when you do parent meetings, taking the device away to prevent the self-harm and the, the suicide, the suicidal thoughts, the identifying with LGBTQ, taking it away or separating is never an option. And, and people like me are horrible motivational speakers because we can't offer a pill that will allow them to use their devices 12 and a half hours a day, which is the average that they're using it. Now, that's an average, some more, some less. Have healthy brains, good morals. And if I can't provide something easy, I'm a terrible speaker. There are no pills that will allow that to happen. Do you understand where I'm coming from? This cultural shift of being open to other ideas other than Christianity to where traditionally this country was not like that starts with the media or comes from the media. Let me give you an example. Some of the Mexican death culture, for example, shows up in the media quite prevalently. So this is Our Lady of Holy Death. We've all seen this. But this really how it manifests itself with Disney and some of the other big media companies, how they propagate this. Trademarking the dead, Coco and the globalization of the Mexican death culture. And that's exactly what it's promoting in a fun, childlike way. Now, I'm not being racist. I'm not being, I mean, there's the different cultures, uh, the different religions. Uh, I, I still hold to the inerrancy of the scriptures, the Christian scriptures, that there's no other name under heaven by which a man or a woman is saved except through the name of Christ which means we have to exclude all other religions. Can you say amen? amen? But this, the globalization of the different and various cultures that are not good for us are made fun and pleasant for children through devices. At least that's how they're peddling it, especially through COVID when the cinemas have been shut down. Now, I went into an adult store. If you want to find out where the affections and the emotions lie of millennials and Gen Zers look no further than their movie library on their devices. So I went into uh, the men's department of, of a store. I think it was Penny's or one of them. And this is what you find. Captain America. Flash. These are not. It's not the children's section. Star Wars. Star Wars. You ever have any idea what message the intent of the author Star Wars is? I mean, what he's trying to peddle? Have a look at this. I put the force into the movies in order to try to awaken a certain kind of spirituality in young people. Uh, more a belief in God than a belief in any particular um, you know, religious system. I mean, the, the, the real question is to ask the question.
Don't center on your anxieties, Obi-Wan. Keep your concentration here and now where it belongs. But Master Yoda said I should be mindful of the future. But not at the expense of the moment. Be mindful of the living force, young Padawan. Don't try to frighten us with your sorcerer's ways, Lord Vader. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion has not helped you conjure up the stolen data tapes, or given you clairvoyance enough to find the rebels' hidden fort. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Here is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate? leads to suffering. Darkness rises and light to meet it. What do you see? The island. Life. Death and decay that feeds new life. Warmth. Cold. Peace. Violence. Meditate on this. I will. So it's not that when we talk about Gen Z only having a 4% biblical worldview, and you talk about uh, the millennials having 6% and so on and so forth, it's not that they become atheists at all. But through the devices, they have a cult-like following many of these Marvel, DC, Star Wars. And make no mistake about it, their learning spirituality is just not ours. And so it's having a detrimental effect on the American church. And so again, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. One of the leading works of the early works of digital addiction came from Dr. Archibald Hart. I think he lives out here somewhere now. His daughter is in charge of a digital wellness center on a university campus. I don't know if you've heard of Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, I went down and met with, with uh, his daughter. And she uh, has my book. I think she read my book. I was introduced to her. And we just hit it off. And... Um, but her dad really was the first one that I discovered in my journey of trying to figure out why this addiction runs so deep. He was the first that brought science into it. And so what I did is I took his work and I created or designed. I had somebody else create it, but I designed some brain animations to give you just a very quick primer on how addiction works. Because addiction is addiction. The reason why my book cover has a, a 13-year-old snorting a white substance off of his iPhone, which are actually zeros and ones... It's not because that's a metaphor of cocaine. It's because of brain scans that I'll show you in a few minutes. When you compare the brain scans, fMRI, there's spec scanning technology. When you compare those brain scans of, of a cocaine addict and a digital addict, they're identical. Because addiction's addiction, and it happens in the same area of the brain. So that's not just a metaphor. It's a scientific fact. So, based on his research, what I did is I designed it. That little dot represents the area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. If there are any neuroscientists here, doctors, you would be very familiar with the pleasure center of the brain. It's part of the reward circuit. Now, it's called the reward circuit because when we stimulate that area with, with stimulation of drugs or visuals, that's the area of the brain where you sense, uh, have the sensation of joy and pleasure. And so the neurotransmitter that's involved here is called dopamine. It's a hormone called the happy chemical. Serotonin is also the happy chemical. But dopamine is the one responsible for giving us the feelings of euphoria when we entertain ourselves. And entertainment's not necessarily sinful. It can certainly be sinful. So let me show you what happens. Someone ingests alcohol, for example. So the alcohol metabolizes through the liver. It migrates to the brain. And it pushes out dopamine. So if they're not actually feeling the alcohol. The alcohol is the propellant or the accelerant that pushes the dopamine into the system in, high, in a high quantity. The heroin addict may inject into a vein. And so very quickly they'll get a high. Cocaine, same thing. It's very close to the brain. And with visuals, 
It's even quicker because the eyes are connected to the occipital lobe right in the back of the head. And the moment they look at something entertaining, the, the, when I played the 911 call for you, you laughed. That, that's where you experienced it. And it was dopamine that caused you to laugh. And so it goes in there and you notice it's lighting up because on scans you'll actually see it light up. And it's not all bad. When it beco- Here's where it becomes bad. You see that little wall that's forming? That's the brain forming a resistance. It's getting used to it. It's building up tolerance to the drug. So therefore it becomes more difficult for the person to receive joy. So what do you do? The alcoholic doesn't start off being an alcoholic. The alcoholic may come home and drink a couple of beers to decompress after work for stress relief. And it's not actually the alcohol giving him the stress relief. It's the dopamine that the, uh, that the alcohol is causing to be pushed into the brain. But after a while, as the brain develops a tolerance to that alcohol, they stop feeling it. So if they want to continue to feel that stress relief, what do they have to do? They have to drink three. And it doesn't mean they're getting more drunk. It just means that they have to drink more to get over the barrier that's forming. That dopaminergic barrier. And that works for a while. And then as time goes by, it stops working. So they end up having to drink four and so on and so forth. Make sense? So that's what tolerance looks like. The exact same mechanism happens with screens. Exactly. That's why the head has to stay down longer. That's why it takes longer and longer to get the kid away from the video game console to come to dinner, then everything flares up. Now, symptomatically with the alcohol, you'll have cirrhosis of the liver. With the smoker, it'll be lung issues. With digital addiction, I'll give you the full list in a minute, you tell me. The babysitter, the tablet or the phone, best babysitter that's ever been invented, and it works great until it comes time to take it away. Anger and aggression, particularly On those who are on the spectrum. Because their brains are hyper wired. They have too much color. So dopamine for us is bad. Dopamine for them is exponentially bad. So a psychologist will often prescribe a tablet to help keep them calm and allegedly stay focused. Neurobiologically, you look at scans and you're mortified. And you'd say, don't ever give them a tablet. Making sense to you? So what eventually happens is that barrier gets really, really big. And notice the color left. And it blocks out all of the dopamine. And emotionally, have you ever heard your kids say, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. And you're thinking, good Lord, you have more stuff than we ever had. Well, it's because you cannot take a kid who's been on a screen playing video games for hours, suddenly cut it off and say, go outside and play. Their brain, if they're going to be stimulated, has to have enough dopamine to penetrate that barrier. Anything beneath that threshold is non-stimulating. And the definition of non-stimulation is what? Boredom. In that lower threshold of activities that should concern us are things like Bible reading, prayer, intimacy with God, So they'll always default to the screen. Now this is something I, I, I don't have very much time. We have about 20 minutes left. So um, I'm not going to be able to go fully into the cutting issue. But in a, essentially what happens is they stop feeling. And there's numerous reasons why people self-harm. Numerous. I'm, I'm limiting my talk to the digital component of it. There's all kinds of. Issues that Patty has very eloquently brought up that is totally correct. Mine is, my contribution to that conversation is, they have blocked out the dopamine because they have a dopaminergic barrier. They stop feeling, and so they trick a different hormone, endorphins, into getting into the system. They'll cut themselves or harm themselves. And the brain doesn't know if that was an accident or not. It just releases these hormones to help us cope with pain, and so they get temporary peace. Problem is... Those hormones are also addictive, so they start to build up tolerance. So the self-harm has to become deeper, longer, harder. And then eventually it stops working. And that's where the deep, dark, suicidal thoughts come in. And when I'm asked about this, I say, well, start with a digital detox. They're like, oh, no. 
I'm sounding the alarm, brothers and sisters. This may be the last time I'm ever allowed to speak to you. Because it seems so harsh. And I'm, do you hear my heart? I'm not trying to be harsh. We're at a very critical point in the, in the history of the Christian church. Where the biblical rule view levels are so low. If, and just think about voting. If, you, if we are trying to get people to vote conservatively. Think of what's going to happen when people in our age group are gone. And the next group comes up with only 4% biblical worldview. There's going to be a vacuum. Everything progressive left wing is going to automatically win by default. We need a spiritual awakening big time. And I have good news. God is more than willing to do that. You believe that? All right, let's lighten it up a little bit. Let me start to give you some solutions. Okay, that was heavy. Let me tell you a little story. Just to break, break it. God sometimes t- tells me, Brad, you're being, okay, I had you be intense. Now you need to lighten up. Beth and I were in a buffet. I like buffets. I call them hog trough. <laughs> um, so we're at this pizza buffet and we're, we went in there and I was waiting in line. And I don't know how you are at pizza buffets or any buffet, but I, I'm very impatient. And I hide it well because I'm a preacher. But inside I'm sinning like crazy. So we're, we're there, and I'm looking at these people going, oh, would you hurry up and stop pushing the thing around and take it? It's like, don't take that piece. That's the one I had my eye on. <laughs> I'm, not, yeah, I'm not showing it. but And as we were standing there, I reach over out of boredom, and I grab her, and I'm giving her a back rub and a neck massage. And when I looked, it wasn't Beth. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, ah! <laughs> it was an elderly lady. <laughs> And I went, ma'am, I am so sorry I was not sexually harassing you. She looked up at me. She goes, it's okay, honey. I was enjoying it. (laughs) And I was just imagining God going, (laughs) lighten up, Brad. All right. What I want to do is talk to you about the distractions and how distractions take over our lives. I want to give you, I want to give you, how many of you can multitask? Raise your women. You better at it than the men. No, you're not. Now. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, you know, normally with multitasking, we try to juggle tons of stuff. And let me tell you what I'm talking about, what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about the mother who has three kids and they're going throughout the house, rummaging, pillaging, trying to burn the house down. And she can manage that and the phone, the washing and all that sort of stuff. Where's dad? Well, he's on the couch. Because if dad had to do all that, the children would pretty much die, right? I mean, (laughs) but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the digital multitasking. Got the phone going. You got got all the stuff you should be doing on the screen. All the stuff happening at the same time. And you think your productivity is up. When in fact, the research clearly shows your productivity drops 40%. Your IQ goes down somewhere between 11 and 17%. Or your cognition, rather. Not IQ. Your IQ lowers. Not that many points. <laughs> now, although I get around some people like, Ugh, yeah. Anyway, that's judging. Judging correctly, though. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to do two things. I'm going to put a poem on the screen. I want you to read it. Not out loud, just to yourself. At the same time, I'm going to have a second and different poem being read audibly. And I want you to pay attention to both. <laughs> then I'm going to give you a cognitive comprehension test to see how well you can manage two things going on at the same time. Are you ready? You know, when I do this in high school, as you know, like the guys are like, <laughs> ready to take it on, evil little creatures. They still fail. Anyway, okay. You ready for this? All right, here we go. The moon seems very lovely, each night it passes by, so beautiful and shiny upon the velvet sky, and yet the moon is really dead, its light is not its own, though shiny it may seem, it's really just a stone. Okay, who participated? Raise your hands if you participated. How many of you got about two seconds into it and said, no, this ain't happening? (laughs) How many of you were... Uh, finally just said, forget it, I'll pay attention to one and do the best I can on this stupid test. How many of you did that? How many of you picked the written one? You lazy. Now, (laughs) 
Here's the test. I don't want you to quote both poems as brief as they were. Who can quote just the first line of each poem? You know why no one's ever gotten it anywhere in the world? It's because when you're paying attention to one, you cannot focus on the other. Your brain is a sequential processor. For any nerds here, you know what that means. You're not threaded. You're not hyper-threaded. Your brain can only do one thing at a time. And then you switch. We call it switch tasking in my world, not multitasking. So it's sort of like when you're sitting there and you're having coffee and you're unloading a burden and you're trying to talk to someone and their phone goes off and they grab it, but they're going, uh-huh, uh-huh, I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening. And I know you've never done that to anyone, but it's been done to you. And, 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 and internally you're irritated because you know they're not paying attention. But the weird thing is when you're doing it to someone else, you think that you can handle it. But it's the same thing. You're not able to pay attention to them and that. And then the other thing that I would say about distraction is your brain, depending on how emotional that thing was that you just looked at, you cannot, even though you're looking straight at the person, when you finish that call or take that test, uh, text, your brain cannot switch. You are still thinking about that whilst you're looking at them. And that can last anywhere from 10 seconds to 30 minutes, depending on how emotional it was. Is that, am, I, am I helping you here? So when, when Beth, how does this translate into practical things? When I get up in the morning to have my devotions, Beth and I do, there's no phones on whatsoever. They're not in the bedroom. They're off. I mean, off, out of the way. So the first thing I do is not very spiritual. It's get a cup of coffee. <laughs> and then when we're at the dinner, the phones are in the car. I haven't had my phone all day. These guys graciously are taking care of processing cards for me out there at my table. They have my phones. I haven't had it all day. Because I, I, when I'm around Patty, I want to learn as much as I can. You understand where I'm coming from? I don't want to be distracted. I'm here to soak it up. The problems, trust me, my problems will still be there when I'm done with this conference. They won't go nowhere. I can deal with them later. Amen? That's called freedom. I trust God with my problems. I used to not, but I do now. I hope I'm helping you. How does this translate? Now, this is a typical study session with kids. It could be your office situation. But basically, you sit down. The kids sit down to do math. And the first thing they do is they have their earbuds in. When I take polls in all these big auditoriums full of kids, I'll say, how many of you listen to music whilst you study? Well, every hand goes up. We are, your brain is switch tasking. And they'll go, uh-uh. I'm like, you really want to argue with me? Really? I'm smarter than you. <laughs> So they sit down and I'll ask them, how, how long is it that you study your math before you grab your phone and check social media? And they'll go, well, I study about 20 minutes and then I check something for about two. Now, they're sincere. That's what they actually believe. But the research actually shows they sit, study a legitimate subject such as math, history, English for two minutes. And then they toggle. That's called rapid toggling. And that can last anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, depending on the level of their addiction. Two minutes is not enough for deep thinking. The hippocampus, which is the short-term memory, has little spurts of information because they have not allowed the data to go in in a contiguous stream. And in long story short, they're not sleeping enough at night, but what little they do, the information gets transferred out of short-term into long-term in a scattered fashion, giving them a scattered brain with fragmented information. Grades are going down around the world because of this. So then they jump back and this rapid toggling is how office work is done and how they're doing it. The poetry test is at work here. Productivity is way down. Cognition is even lower. Am I helping you here? So what do you do? Well, I want to give you the solution to this uh, right away. The first thing I would say, I'm going to put that back up in just a moment, but I want to Solve this spiritually. Do you believe that when we look for solutions, the first thing we should look to is the Word of God? Not science. I like science. Can you tell? But I like God more. He's a lot more reliable. His research is bulletproof. When it comes to these cultural issues, LGBTQ, one in six identifying, when it comes to these very low uh, biblical worldview rates, 
tracing all the cutting and the suicide back to social media. The only thing I can tell you is, is that God's word still has the answer that works every time. And that is things like this. Come out from them and be separate. We are supposed to be a different people as believers, not wrapped up in the world's system. Any amens now? That was weak. That was so weak. Stop touching these unclean things. Stop. Not back off. But but, but we have to. But, but we have to have. Well they have to. It's not what God says. If it's unclean. And it's harming. Stop touching it. Separate from it. It's called holiness. And if we do that. God will receive us. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be separated or holy. Do you, want, do you want this nation to see God again? It's very quiet. Do you still love me? You were laughing with me a minute ago. Now you're like, oh, I don't like him now. He's reading the wrong scripture. You, you should cherry pick those scriptures, son. Cherry pick them. Grace, grace, grace. Do the smiley preacher thing. Your best technology now. I don't know. It's, some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, we won't see the Lord. Without that work of separation, you're not going to see it. They have, we have no business touching unclean things. Is that it? Don't you have a little psychology for me? No, I don't. That's what I have for you. <laughs> God's word is enough. Can you trust him? Can you trust him? Yes. So how would you fix a situation like this? Well, when you start to study in your office or to do the report for the boss, no music, total silence. This has to, there's a lot of science behind everything I'm telling you. Believe me, you just don't have time to lay it all out now, but the book, there's a book full of this stuff out there. And a third one coming. No music. No phone. And no entertainment tabs. What I mean by that is during COVID, one of the legitimate uses of technology is being able to use Google Classroom and Zoom. I'm not against any of this stuff. Nobody has ever come to me and said, Brad, pray for me. I'm so addicted to Word. Just can't stop typing. No, no student has ever come to me and said, I can't get out of Zoom. I can't wait for class tomorrow. Pray for me. But what they do come regularly is say, Hey, I'm looking at porn and now I can't sleep. My brain won't switch off and these images won't leave. They, they, they do. See, see where I'm coming from? So you get rid of those entertainment tabs where there's no email, there's no social media, nothing. And you focus on the math thing that's online if that's how you're having to learn. And then when you're done with that, no, no checking anything. Then move on to the next subject and the next subject. And if I were you and I'm being sincere, God is clear that these things are permissible. But the things that enslave us, I would get rid of those three and delete them never to be on my phone ever again. Or allow them to be on your kid's phone. And I would never ever play another video game ever again. Even Christian ones or education ones. Especially education ones. Now there's science behind everything I'm telling you. I, I'm, but my time is just about up. And I'm sure you have. <laughs> like you want to argue so badly with me. But. <laughs> but will you trust me if I tell you I'm coming at this from a research perspective. And it's documented. So here's what you do. If you are addicted. Saying things like balance and limit. Won't work. It's sort of like. Trying to put a band-aid on a broken leg. You have to detox first. You have to get completely away from it. The research is clear. It takes a minimum of four to six weeks. And during that four to six weeks. You can't have any screens at all. Including television. And then you return to limited technology. And I want you to use a different def definition of limit than what you're probably already used to using. You want, want this one to be based 
in neurobiology. Which means it could be a whole lot different than the vague definition you've been working with of balance and limit. These are hard limits. I mean, there's actually numbers here. So let me just show you some of the evidence scientifically, and then I'll give you a list of stuff, and then I'll close in prayer. Have I bored you? Okay, good. Are you mad at me? Good. Because <laughs> the exit's way over there. <laughs> All right, now, that is a baseline of a healthy brain. Different scanning technology here. This is called SPECT. That's what a marijuana's brain, a marijuana is like. Problem is, every marijuana addict believes they're the exception. It doesn't bother me, man. I'm like, that's why you talk like this, man. Because <laughs> your brain looks like that, man. <laughs> See those holes? It's a measure of activity. The brain, if you were to take it out of the skull, doesn't actually look like that. But when you scan it, the neurons are not firing. They're deadening. Walls up. They're anhedonic. Same with the meth. Let me show you this one. There's the baseline of the healthy brain. Measure the deviation of a heroin brain. See those big dips? That's why a heroin addict acts the way they do. They'll steal, do whatever they have to do to get the drug. And let me show you the worst one of all. That's digital addiction. That's the porn brain. That stimulation came through the eyes from a phone. See those big holes? That's digital addiction. And there's healing for all of this. Um, Dr. Daniel Amen provides treatment. You might be thinking, did, what do you use? Psychology, other drugs? No. He made them stop. I want to show you what empathy, a lack of empathy looks like, and I'll give you the quick list. And I've got three minutes to do it, and I'm finished. Watch this. I'll let that play long on purpose. And this is rhetorical, so I don't want anybody raising your hands or anything. And they come here and embarrass you. I, I have been so addicted digitally, you have no idea. I judge no one. I'm only trying to pass on the freedom that God has given me. And even though I'm free now, I have to be careful every single day. It's like, like I've lost a lot of weight and gotten really fit. But if I eat one Oreo, the chances of me eating the whole bag is really high. I'm serious. When you study sugar, it's like heroin. Brain scans. Same with digital. I could easily fall back into it. So I judge no one. Do you hear me? I love you. And I mean that. I'm trying to pass on the freedom that I have currently. And with good accountability. But the reason why I let that play is because some of you, I think probably inside, we're going, okay, that's enough now. I get it. I get it. You can stop that now. Yeah, that's, I've seen it. I, but I wanted conviction to have its work. Not condemnation, but conviction. So, so the message here to help you, aren't you glad that God does not treat us this way? Whenever we come to him and we want to climb up on his lap, he picks us up immediately and stops whatever it is he's doing, managing the whole universe. And he holds us individually right away. And then we're to model that to the kids instead of doing what she did. And I'm not judging her either because I've been addicted. But you get my point? I think by letting that conviction have its work, Rather than give you a laundry list of stuff to do, that probably helped you more than anything in that brief period of time. Because you won't forget that. But, but, but what I want you to take away from here remembering is, is that God does not treat us that way. 
And he's not mad at you if you have treated your kids that way. He still loves you. He will still redeem you. And he still adores you. And even though you come to him with all that baggage, he will still pick you up and hold you on his lap even if you've done that to your kids. Because he loves you a lot. That's what the death, burial, and the resurrection paid for. I hope you're encouraged because I've had to crawl up on his lap after doing a lot of dumb stuff. Just listen to my accent. You can imagine what I'm guilty of. I get around some of these academics because I speak in academic circles. I do all this stuff and I'm thinking, I wonder what they would think if they knew I eat squirrels. Because I do. <laughs> so there. So many things I want to tell you, but I'm out of time. I want to leave you with this. There's a whole list of stuff I could give you, but I just don't have time. Um, but it's in the book. It's not a shameless sell. But it is. Um, I have to have technology to do my schoolwork. Kids tell me all the time, or I have to know how to use technology in order to get a job. And I think they're expecting that those two phrases to say, okay, we got you now. We've, we've defeated all of your science stuff. But I look at these evil little creatures and I'll go, I agree with you. I do. It's the world we live in. I didn't renounce my computer science degree. Still have it. It's old, antiquated, but it got me started. If I were to grab their phone, i say, here's what I'm talking about. If I were to grab any phone in the world, I would generally find educational stuff like Google Sheets and Docs or Excel, PowerPoint. But I'd also find Fortnite, Google Classroom, Netflix, Minecraft, Snapchat, TikTok, Word, Instagram, porn, YouTube, the whole thing. But the work of separation, the things that will get you a job versus the thing that enslave you, it would just look like this. I never once said, throw it all out. But you should throw some of it out and separate from it and stop touching it because it's unclean. You should. And that's what it should look like. There's the, the internet's still there. The technology's still there. But it's the stuff that you typically don't get. Look, I've always, <laughs> I used to use the illustration, nobody's ever come to me and said, pray for me, I'm so addicted to Excel. <laughs> then I had a couple of accountants say, well. <laughs> so I quit using that. I went to Word because of people like you that do something. I go, oh, I struggle with these formulas. <laughs> anyway, so what do you replace it with? Well, how about freedom? How about worship? How about nature? How about the scriptures? How about people? Face to face. And that's what you do. And the word of God is still the answer. This movement called Calvary Chapel. God started it. And there needs to be a renewal. You still teach the word of God. I do. Believe line upon line. Just need a renewal of it to pass it on to the younger ones. Amen. And that's the focus, not trying to mix it in with all that other stuff. All right, let me pray for you. Father, I pray that no one will leave here today feeling condemned whatsoever. But let them see, Lord God, what healing looks like. And Father, in this last image, I pray that you will spark a personal revival in this last image. And that they will walk out of here feeling so built up and so joyful with hope of what you want to do. And it's in Jesus' name I ask these things. All right, put that back up one more time. I'm going to show you the last image. They're fMRI scans of a, of a kid who's massively addicted to Minecraft. Lots of research gone into the video games. And all the color had left. In his brain. And you can clearly see it. So he's a triplet. His brother and sister are normal. And see that one right there? That's the Minecraft brain. See the color gone? It's left this child angry. Defiant. 
total personality change, cognition gone way down. They take Minecraft away from him. It's the only parent I've ever known to actually do it. They put him in the neuroscience project. They sent him off to summer camp. They did horrible things to him. They only allowed him to swim, play tennis, hike, fish. <laughs> Awful. After three weeks of no technology, they brought him back into the lab. They rescanned his brain, and this is what happened to him. And that's why I came here, was to show you what God wants for all of us. That's called renewal. Amen?